Hey everyone, this is Brady, the Game Dev Artisan. In today's video, we're going to be continuing our series on Godot Fundamentals. We'll be adding a simple user interface to our game, which will include a score, which will increase when we pick up our collectibles. We'll also be adding a reload indicator to visualize the weapon's reload status. To get started, I'd like to first address our project's organization. The best practice that I've found is if I use a new scene for the game, I can easily wrap in the world and the user interface layers. Before we do that though, let's take a look at our project file system overview. In our scenes folder, we've started to add a lot of scenes and scripts. We can improve this by adding further layers of organization with folders. For example, in our scenes folder, let's create an entities folder. And inside our entities folder, let's create one for our tank. Inside this tank folder, we can bring our tank scene and script, as well as the weapon scene and script, and bring those into that tank folder. Notice that if you have a scene open, you might get some errors for likely dependency issues. Just hit OK. We'll test those in a moment. Now inside our tank, we also want to add a folder for the weapon in case we wanted to create different types of weapons. We can move our weapon scene and script into there. We can also consider bringing our bullet in there as well. Next, let's address some of the world scene. Inside our entity, let's create a new folder for world objects. We'll just call this world for now. And inside that world folder, we can bring our crate, pickup, and wall scenes. That looks good. Let's go ahead and collapse the entities. And we'll create a new folder within our scenes, and we'll call this UI. We'll store any UI-related scenes in here. I also like to have a world scene at the root of my scenes folder. And this can contain levels. You can also put your objects there as well. For our purposes, we'll just keep our world objects within our entities folder. Now we can go ahead and drag our world into our world folder. And inside our scenes, I like to create a new game scene. We'll call this game.tscn. We'll keep this of type 2D scene. And the goal of this scene is to wrap together your world and objects. So if we had multiple levels for our game, we'd want to be able to drag those into our game instance, which means our world scene shouldn't actually contain the tank directly. So let's go ahead and enter into our world scene. We'll remove our tank from the world scene directly and return to our game scene and add our tank scene back into the game. Make sure you save your world scene so that your game scene will reflect that. And here we can move our tank into a similar position and save that as well. Now that we've created this new game scene, let's go ahead and set this as our new main scene. When we play our game, we'll use the main scene to wrap any of our world and tank objects, as well as any user interface that we create. Let's go ahead and create our user interface now. We right click on our UI and create a new scene. And here we're going to use a node of type canvas layer. Let's go ahead and call this UI.tscn. We'll keep the root node called UI in all caps. Now inside this UI node, let's go ahead and add a control node. This control node will act as the root for our UI. Control nodes all have different behaviors for how we can anchor and scale based off the resolution of our screen. We select our control nodes preferences. We can select this full rectangle mode. You'll notice that when we select this, the bounds and anchoring, which are the green icons, scale to the resolution of our window. This is great for sizing and laying out your UI. Now for our UI, let's add some margin. We can do that by adding a margin control node called a margin container. We'll also take the preferences for this container and let it stretch to the full rectangle. An important note about control nodes is that the parent typically will control the behavior of all child elements. So if our control node root wasn't scaled to a full rectangle, the margin container would be unable to do that. Now inside our margin container, if we go to our theme overrides in our inspector panel and expand the constants, we can add some padding and margin to the left, top, right, and bottom. Let's just do 32 pixels on all four of those for now. You won't immediately see this effect until you add children to the container. Let's go ahead and add a VBox container. Now you'll notice that our padding or margin has been added and our VBox container is taking up the full rectangle. Now for our purposes, let's go ahead and move our VBox container to scale 
only vertically to the top by shrinking to the beginning of the alignment. For our horizontal, we'll stretch from left to right. That's the default behavior. Next, we're gonna span across the horizontal with a container called HBox. And inside our HBox container, we're gonna add a label. Let's go ahead and call this label score. And for this score, we'll go ahead and give it a unique name so that we can access this in a script. Now let's add a script to our UI. We'll call this UI.GD. We'll also give this a class name of UI. Now we'll click and drag our score label with a control click, and we'll call this score label. We'll add some behavior to be able to keep track of our score within our UI. Now we'll set this equal to zero by default and add a setter method. Now one behavior we'd like to introduce is the ability to update our label whenever our score changes. We can create a new function for this. We'll call it update score label. And for this, what we'll do is we'll take our score label and we'll set the text value equal to the string value of our score. Now, whenever our score gets set, we can use our setter method to automatically update our score's label to correlate. Read more about the setter and getter functions on a variable in Godot's documentation. Now that we have this new function, let's set it as the default to run when our node is ready. Now let's link our tank's collectible pickups to set a new score based off a signal. To do this, let's create a new function and we'll call this underscore on underscore collected. And we're looking for a collectible to be picked up. And if this is a collectible, then we'll take our score and we'll add 100. Now to tie this into our tank, let's open up our tank scene. And inside here, we can add a new function. So we'll create our new function. We'll call it collect. And this will receive a type of collectible. Now here, we'll want to emit a signal when something has been collected on our tank. At the top, create a signal. We'll call it collected. This will emit the type of collectible that's been picked up. Back in our new function, we can call the signal collected and emit the value of collectible. Inside of our entity pickup within our world, if our body is a type of tank, we know that we now have our new collect function. And here we can provide the value of self, which is a type of pickup. Now that our tank is able to collect and emit a signal that something has been collected, let's bind that new signal to our UI layer. This is where our game scene comes into play. Now within our game scene, let's add a script. We'll call this game.gd and give it a class name of game. Now let's add two export variables to bind our game scene with the tank and UI. Inside our game scene, let's create an instance of our UI scene. And on our export variables, we can assign our tank and our UI. Now that those are bound, inside of our ready function, let's go ahead and ensure that our tank and UI methods can be bound based off the proper signals that the tank emits. And for our tank, we'll take the collected signal and we'll connect the UI's on collected function. Now, a best practice is to check if that signal is connected. And if not, it will establish that connection. Now that we've wired up our UI to our tank, when our tank collects a pickup, it should emit the signal that it's been collected and our UI layer will then set the new score and update the label. Ensure that when you check whether or not a signal is connected, that you invert that to say it's not connected before making the connection. And if we rerun that, we can see that our score is now being updated. Now back to our UI, let's add a new HBox container inside our VBox container. And this will contain our reload progress bar. We're gonna use a texture progress bar. We'll call this 
we'll call this reload progress. We'll go ahead and give that a unique name. We'll click and drag that in, holding control, create an on ready variable for our reload progress bar. Now to track the progress of our reload state, inside our script, we're gonna to wanna to add two functions. One for when our reload progress ticks, which will set up a signal for this from our weapon to our tank. And this will pass in the progress of our reload timer. And on this, we can update the reload progress's value equal to that progress. We can also add an on reloaded function that will take the reload's progress value and set it equal to one. And for our reload icon, we'll use an ammo sprite with a background and a foreground image. If we import those into our sprites, we can take our reload progress bar's textures in our inspector panel. We can create our under image using an atlas texture and setting that to our ammo UI icon, which has a dimension of 16 pixels by 16 pixels. And we can copy that texture and set that to our progress texture. To make this unique, we can expand this and offset this by 16 pixels to get our foreground picture. Now let's change some settings about our fill mode. We want our progress to start from the bottom and go up to the top. We want to do this from a value that starts at zero and goes to one. We'll do this in incremental steps of 0.1. We'll set a default value of one. And if we go to our 2D view, we can see that our reload progress is below where our score should be. Let's also add to our score a default text of zero. Now, to tie our reload progress in, we need to add some signals to both our tank and our weapon. In order to inform our UI that the tank has been reloaded or is in the progress of reloading, we'll want to first go into our tank and into the weapon scene. Our weapon scene has its reload timer. And inside our weapon script, we'll add two signals. Our first signal will be called reloaded to inform when this weapon has been reloaded. And the second we'll call reload progress. And this will update as long as the timer is running for our reload and what its current progress is. To track our reload progress, inside our function process, we'll check if our reload timer is stopped. If it's not stopped, then we're going to take our reload progress and we're going to emit the remaining value or the current progress, which is one minus our reload timer's time left divided by our reload timer's wait time. This should map a number between zero and one for the current progress of the remaining time. In addition to emitting our progress, let's go ahead and emit whenever our reload timer is completed. We can easily do this in our timeout. After we change our state, we can say reloaded signal is emit. Now that our weapon is emitting both when it's reloaded and the progress of it reloading, we want to basically mirror that in our tank. So inside our tank, we'll add two additional signals for reloaded as well as reload progress. We'll create a ready function. It takes the weapons reloaded signal and connects with a lambda function that calls its own reloaded signal and emits that. Learn more about lambda functions within Godot's documentation. We'll also want to take our reloaded progress signal from our weapon and we'll connect with another lambda function that takes in the progress of our weapon's progress. And we will emit our own reload progress passing in the same progress value. This is a quick and easy way to mirror a signal from a child element, such as our weapon, through to the tank class. Now within our UI, we can easily bind the reload progress's functions that we've created to the tank's reload state. We can do this within our game by adding an additional signal to check whether or not our tank reload progress is connected to the UI's on reload progress. If not, we want to go ahead and set that to be 
connected by calling the connect function. We can copy this and do it one more time for our reloaded state. We'll call the on reloaded within our UI. And if we rerun this, we'll see we have our new reload UI. And if we shoot, we'll notice that it continually is reloading. If we return to our editor and go to our weapon, we select our reload timer. We'll notice that our timer is not set to one shot. This means after the timer completes, it'll run again. We've already set it up so that our reload timer is started whenever we change to the firing state. Let's go ahead and check this box to set it to one shot. This means that once the timer ends, it doesn't automatically start back up. And if we return to our game and continue to fire, we'll notice the reload timer UI updates accordingly. And there we have a simple UI. Be sure to take advantage of signals to easily tie in UI behavior. You can easily tie multiple objects together using signals and add behavior to update elements on the screen. And if you've enjoyed this video, please give us a like. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe and be notified when we have new videos. And let us know in the comments if there's anything you'd like us to cover next. Thanks again for watching and happy coding.